Hi, so yeah, I'm Phil Clotty, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm glad to have the opportunity to actually see people in person. I haven't given a presentation uh, except on Zoom or like recording to my webcam in a while. Uh, I'd prefer to be in a room with you guys with a whiteboard, but you know, th this will do. Um, so uh, service providers are, um, are moving to be more cloud native. And there are a couple of key drivers to this uh, that we all know. There's 5G, um, there's the kind of connected thing moving to the edge, but there's also the sort of general modernizing uh, effect of it and wanting to be um, participate in the broader CICD type uh, digital transformation. Um, and, uh, and there are benefits that they're hoping to get from these in terms of flexibility, agility, efficiency. Um, and these particular things are well suited uh, to a cloud native environment. Uh, I want to be clear, sometimes when people start talking about cloud native, um, you know, they're zealots. And, you know, if it's not cloud native, it's crap. But uh, I am not a zealot. Uh, there is a place for, um, uh, for monolithic architecture. There is a place for static configuration. There is a place for big iron and, uh, you know, dedicated hardware. Um, but these things, uh, I think, are well chosen to be uh, cloud native. Now, uh, if you are going cloud native in today's world, it really means that you are probably going to be working with Kubernetes. Um, is it, uh, if you look up cloud native, is it by definition, uh, do you see that it has to be Kubernetes? Well, no. Well, cloud native is a whole set of sort of concepts. But, um, but really, the uh, platform of choice, the, the orchestrator, the management, the, 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 the place to do cloud native is inside of Kubernetes. Now, even though cloud native uh, implies that you're going to be working with Kubernetes, it is not necessarily true exactly in the other way. Just because you have checked the Kubernetes box does not mean that you're cloud native. And, um, again, don't get me wrong, I have worked on those projects that are important to check the box, um, you know, where a VP says, we need 40% of our network functions to be cloud native by Q3. Um, but, um, but it is important that if you work within Kubernetes, um, you can get the benefits uh, that you're looking for, and, and, but if you step outside, uh, those benefits can disappear. Um, now, again, they're moving to Kubernetes, but uh, that presents several problems uh, because Kubernetes really wasn't designed for telco use cases. Um, first of all, uh, and I, I sort of cite three big categories of, of reasons that that's true. Uh, first of all, Kubernetes really focuses on what happens inside the Kubernetes cluster. And so it's not um, designed as much in terms of how to fit within a broader, more complex network. And the thing about telcos uh, is that they are networking companies, and the networking matters, and the, 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 the networking situation is significantly more complex inside of, uh, of a, a mobile operator. Um, you have a significant amount of uh, routing infrastructure. I don't need to tell you guys about the SDN and all the rest of these things. Um, you have uh, lots of firewalls, you have VRFs and VLANs, um, and you're separating your RAN network from your services network, and you have an OAM network, and you have all of these others. Um, and it's a very complex network to fit within, and uh, Kubernetes doesn't really do that. I was actually very interested in the earlier Juniper thing about, um, uh, about some of those same, same problems. Um, secondly, though, the Kubernetes concepts, and this I think is a little more fundamental, the Kubernetes concepts don't directly map to like the 5G concepts. So, you know, the idea of a service is great, and certainly like in 5G, they have tried to, um, to move to this service-based architecture, and there are some interfaces that are really where they're trying to use, uh, you know, web interfaces, and they're trying to do things to be more consistent uh, with the patterns that are happening outside of telecom. Um, but, uh, but really, um, that's not the, the end of the conversation. Um, Kubernetes doesn't 
Um, it, it, it doesn't take into account all of the different interfaces. It doesn't take into account, you know, the non-3GPB interfaces as well. And the fact that, you know, a network function is something that really sends and receives. It isn't like just a pure service that just sits there and listens like a single API. Um, and there's a lot of complexity there. We had, um, before the pandemic, about four years ago, we had one of the original team from Kubernetes, the original team that created Kubernetes out to F5, and we were just peppering him with questions about networking and Kubernetes. And finally, he just kind of threw up his hands and he said, look, you know, our, our guys who were programming this were programmers. They weren't networking guys, all right? They were trying to get it ready. And really, the idea behind Kubernetes, fundamentally, is to make it easier for the app developers, for the people writing the software, and make it simple for them. Um, and then over time, you know, more and more has developed around the networking uh, area. Um, and then the third thing is um, around security. Now, Kubernetes inside of, again, Kubernetes really is largely focused about being inside that Kubernetes cluster. Inside of Kubernetes, there is, you know, a fair bit of security. There are a lot of, you know, policies um, and, uh, you know, RBAC, um, and there are, you know, service meshes that can do your certificate rotations and all of these kinds of things. Um, but in terms of fitting within the broader security context, uh, Kubernetes just really isn't there. Uh, um, how, in, it, how it interfaces into that broader telco network, um, the security uh, aspects of it just, just are, are really not quite uh, uh, carrier grade. So the question is, you know, if Kubernetes is, you know, not fit for, for, for purpose, if, you know, if Kubernetes really doesn't do all of the things that you want Kubernetes to do, you have really two choices. You can either extend Kubernetes, and again, one of the neat things about Kubernetes is that it is extensible. You can do more with Kubernetes than vanilla Kubernetes out of the box. Or you can just light a match to it, um, hack around it, uh, break the patterns, um, and do as you please. And both of these are our options. Um, but, uh, uh, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the, the kinds of things that we are seeing in 5G deployments as they're coming together at different telcos. So one of those uh, is just plain circumventing the networking in Kubernetes. So we're uh, preparing to launch a 5G standalone uh, with a large uh, carrier in North America. And um, they did what we call a vertical approach, where they create uh, the infrastructure for the network functions to run on, and then they buy the network functions from all the different NEPs. And, um, and so they have really all of the major players, aside from perhaps um, you know, one that doesn't, doesn't play in, in North America. But, um, it's interesting that all of the CNF vendors came to them and said, uh, we need Maltus. Now, for those of you who are not um, familiar with, uh, uh, with Kubernetes, Maltus is a concept where you can get a second interface. So ordinarily in Kubernetes, applications uh, just get a single interface. Um, and when they run, um, they present, you know, for their service or whatever, they have a single interface, ETH0, and then they sort of let Kubernetes take care of the networking. You know, and there are a whole bunch of pieces to that, CNIs and um, service meshes and uh, the concepts of services and all kinds of other things. Um, but usually you get one interface. What Multis does is allow you to get a second interface. And the question is, is why did they want those second interfaces? And the answer is that they, um, they had numerous uh, use cases that were not uh, able to be done through the normal Kubernetes networking. Now let's talk just for a second about how normally you would, you would present something in Kubernetes. So here in the middle, um, you have a router that is coming in uh, one way or another to these services. And the, um, there are a number of different ways that works in Kubernetes, but a service really represents um, something that you can expose uh, to the outside world. And the nice thing about using this system 
is that that service is presented consistently to the outside world. So even if you have you know, pods uh, going up and down um, and uh, y you know, maybe you have some that are dying, maybe you're scaling out, maybe you're doing whatever, the complexity that happens inside of Kubernetes is contained in Kubernetes, and you're still presenting this single service to the outside world. And so this middle thing, you know, really the only thing that we see coming through here are some of those SBA interfaces. Uh, pretty much everything else, they're asking for separate direct network access to the outside world. And this causes significant complexity, because essentially what you're doing is you're taking uh, Kubernetes, which is meant to orchestrate and contain all of that complexity of a dynamic, uh, ever-changing environment, and simplify it and present it to the outside world as, say, a single service, and you're exploding that out, and you're spilling your complexity out into the rest of the network. And this is where, um, this is sort of where the worst of uh, cloud-native and non-cloud-native come together, because you're getting the complexity of cloud native, but then you're spilling that out into your, uh, your general network, which is um, not cloud native. Um, and, uh, um, and so I, I wrote, I put these little guys here, network function owner one and network function owner two. Um, and part of what I'm trying to get across here is this, that you know, some people say, and I see this particularly uh, a lot in, in Europe, some people say, well, you know, we're, we're going with a single, single vendor strategy. They'll deal with all that. Sure, they're making it extremely complex, but they'll deal with it. But ultimately, uh, this complexity will end up uh, emerging uh, and becoming operational complexity uh, for the, the service providers. And the, the owners of those applications in each service provider are going to be the people who are going to have to deal with that complexity. And the kinds of complexity we're talking about is um, partly just IP address management type complexity. You know, these things generally are not uh, advertising routes to themselves, so there's no, nothing dynamic in terms of the routing. Um, you have to configure all of the sort of outside bits separately for each of them. Y you have to deal with the fact that your clients now are going to be talking to something which can go up or down at any time. The number of connections can change at any given time, et cetera. Then you have the security complexity, and here the problem is, is that once you kind of explode out of Kubernetes, um, your attack surface dramatically increases. So instead of having sort of one path through to these services, you've got all these paths to each different network function, um, to each different uh, new interface that they expose. Um, and then additionally, you have a, the sort of overall architectural complexity, which is that you're taking something that is highly dynamic and exposing it out. Another thing that we're seeing uh, frequently, and again, that, that was something that every network function at this tier one came to um, and said, we need this. Another thing we're seeing, and this is happening very commonly, uh, and again, is happening um, uh, pretty much uh, everywhere in Europe, is this concept of having a separate cluster per network function, per CNF. And unlike with uh, the earlier case where I was talking about ingress, where traffic was flowing in into a service, the way that traffic leaves Kubernetes is a little haphazard. Um, and so, you know, if you find a packet floating around in your network, you'd like to know what network function it came from, right? I mean, some network functions can reach your RAN network. So you want to know, I should let this through my firewall. I should allow this to access my RAN network. Some shouldn't. You don't want to just know it came from that Kubernetes cluster over there. And the problem is, is that in general, Kubernetes, egress in Kubernetes, this, this traffic heading out of Kubernetes, is like the neglected stepchild of Kubernetes. And so the, the way that people are getting around that is by making a separate cluster for each CNF. So yeah, you can only tell that it came from that cluster over there, but that cluster is all AMFs, so I guess anything from there I should let into my RAN network, which is a little nuts, because it also means like any bash script over there I should let, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, and more so, it, uh, it dramatically increases um, costs, uh, partly because you have a, a ton of wasted uh, hardware, um, 
you have something totally inflexible because you really are either cookie cutter, cutter stamping these Kubernetes clusters um, or you're having them to be wildly different sizes and different per each CNF, which adds massive uh, operational complexity. Um, and really, this is worse than just allowing people to bring in uh, an appliance and plug it in. I mean, it's, it's worse because it, it's like that because you have, you have a separate thing that is each network function, but it's worse because you know, they're, they're also doing this. Um, it's worse because, uh, because these weird constraints in terms of whether you're going to go cookie cutter or not, et cetera. And again, uh, choosing a single stack from just one provider will not fix this. Um, this is something we see cur currently being pitched by a lot of single stack vendors. So what, what we're uh, recommending is thinking of something new, uh, and we call it a service proxy. And the idea behind a service proxy is to create a single pane of glass to connect to the outside world, to create that interface that understands um, uh, how to connect uh, a Kubernetes cluster to this broader network, how to connect it um, both in terms of, uh, you know, routing and, uh, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things, but also how to connect it in terms of representing things as network functions. So first and foremost, it needs to use the Kubernetes native patterns um, and extend those so that everything is orchestrated by Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes, the thing it's good at is orchestrating dynamic environments uh, to present something consistent. Uh, it also needs to interface with the broader network. Again, I talked about that. It should really link ingress and egress. So it should, you shouldn't have two totally separate paths. You should have something that, where, where it can represent uh, the single network function. And that really comes to the next one, linking ingress and egress per CNF, so that each CNF is its own thing and is presented in a way, even though you may have multiple CNFs within a cluster. Then you need broad L4 and L7 support, uh, including both 5G, network, uh, 5G uh, protocols, TCP, HTTP, NGAP, uh, SCTP, plus 4G diameter, et cetera, and on 3GPP. Um, and a security layer. Having a nice single pane of glass, a single way in and out, allows you to then control for your DDoS protection, for your application uh, protection, for your firewalling. Um, and, um, uh, and it allows you to present that CNF to the outside world. And again, if you take a look at each of the three um, areas that I talked about, uh, in terms of fitting into the broader network, it allows you to have that single point of interfacing for that, for that broader network and making the cluster a part of the network inherently. Um, if you're talking about mapping to network functions, it brings together the protocols and ties together the ingress and egress so that you have a full network function, a full CNF together. Um, and, uh, and in terms of security, it provides that sort of single point uh, for security control in and out of Kubernetes. Um, and this, this is what we think is needed uh, to be able to have actual cloud native functions. You have to decide if CNF stands for just containerized network function, you've checked a box, you're done, but your operations and your uh, hardware expenses are going to go up, and we're going to have the same failures that we had in, uh, in NFV, or whether you want it to be a cloud native network function uh, and, uh, and realize the benefits of being cloud native. Thank you.